Good evening, everyone. Nice to see everyone. We have some uh, guests, as you as you will meet in a minute. And we, I can see we have some guests in the audience and friends. And uh, so uh, it, it, it's very nice to see everybody here tonight uh, for this kind of festive musical occasion. Uh, Tim has been working a lot on uh, uh, the organization of this kind of thing, and, and, and uh, so uh, Tim Hartnett from our library is going to say a few words, and we'll get started. Thanks, Tim. Okay, great. Well, we have special guests, obviously, here today. This is the Brothers Blue Band, all the way from Buffalo. They are here in the northeast part of New York and Vermont as part of the Big Eye Rabbit Tour. On the 18th, they played at Saratoga, at Wine Caroline. On the 19th, they played over at Radio Bean in Burlington. Some of you may know about that with the venue. The 21st in Montpelier at the Gilles Cafe. The 22nd in Lebanon. You guys have been really busy. <laughs> at Salt Hill Pub. Yeah. On the 23rd, they were in Lake Placid at the Smoke Signals, another venue you may be familiar with. Uh, back in Canada on the 24th. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see Plattsburgh on here. Um, but... And that's because it's, it's, it's a closed event. You know, they put it up there, God knows the number of people that be jamming that door. It didn't like, have yeah. money for security and everything. Well, exactly. <laughs> it wasn't in the budget this it time. It was crazy. So I'm going to read very briefly some pieces from your website as by way of introduction. Uh, Brothers Blue is an original songwriting band, okay, that contain elements from country, bluegrass, Cajun, and Irish, so they're not strictly speaking a bluegrass band, but they use all these various elements in their song, right? Um, they have three-part harmony, which is something you Joe Valors know all about, having seen so much of that over the weekend. Uh, fiddle, banjo, guitar, upright bass, multi-instrumentalist, each one of them. So it's, it's hard to keep track. I was trying to identify them by the instruments shown in their photos. It's like, well, this guy's playing a fiddle now, but now he's holding bass, so which one is he, you know? <laughs> Couldn't quite, you know... <laughs> Finally narrowed it down. But anyway, uh, so the multi-instrumental aspect is very key to the group. Uh, Benny, who is on your right, uh, and Matt, who is right here with the guitar, uh, began learning songs together when they were basically bicycling on trips through Tender Lakes and right. Southern Tier. Um, and they grew up in, please tell me how you pronounce that hometown. Call it Honey Away. Honey oil. Honey oil. Anybody know honey, honey oil? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you guys play on the team or? Uh, yeah. We're musicians. Uh, okay. <laughs> Protect the hands, right? We were. Uh, Not the athletic bunch. Yeah. Anyway, they'll tell you more about their their upbringing there and their influences there. Um, as uh, that was involved with a group called Brickwater, he met Charlie who's in the middle, uh, filler in 2013, and from there, the Brothers Blue just sort of merged and took form and are going full steam ahead. So I'm going to yeah. stop talking and let them do whatever they want to do. And I strongly encourage you to ask questions about anything that you may be curious about. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, so we, we understand uh, you are all at the Joe Vale? Uh, festival? Or some of you are. Okay. Yeah, great. Well, How many of y'all are, are players? Most of you. Sweet. Good. We weren't Excellent. sure if we were going to be talking about playing or, or history. or I mean, we'll talk about a little bit of both. But right. It's good that there's some pickers out there. You'll, you'll kind of know the language that we're talking about. So. Yeah, certainly. Um, so we'd like to start just by playing uh, more or less traditional uh, bluegrass. Uh, tune. Uh, this is a uh, actually a couple tunes. This is a, the first one is a tune by uh, the great Bill Monroe uh, called Gold Rush, and uh, we strung this one together. We set it uh, together with a with another traditional called Blackberry Blossom. So uh, this is our arrangement. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. So, so that yeah, those those two tunes um, are 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 two that we we put together. Um, and uh, I, we have to make a confession that we're that we're not, not purely a bluegrass band, bluegrass band. <laughs> <laughs> or some you might argue not a bluegrass band at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we have roots in in, in lots of different uh, areas, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but those those two tunes we thought we'd open with today because uh, to us they're kind of uh, in, in our in our repertoire uh, archetypes in, in our minds of, of what bluegrass is, um, which which we we would like to kind of embellish on a little bit, uh, or at least what we think bluegrass is. Um, which is a <coughs> really good question. What is bluegrass? And <laughs> we were hanging out at. at Matt's aunt and uncle's house today, and, and Matt's aunt asked the question. She said, I hope this isn't a stupid question. Um, can you play bluegrass music on other instruments, on instruments that aren't just wooden strings? And I thought that was a really good question. I mean, if you had a, if you had a tuba playing the bass line, and you had a piano playing the chords, and you had a flute playing the melody, would it still be bluegrass? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, but we started talking about it. We were, but then, just because you have a guitar and a mandolin and a banjo and a bass, doesn't make it bluegrass music. You could could you play anything and it would be bluegrass? I don't think so. Right? You kind of have to have the instrumentation and the certain groove or um, um, the certain way you're playing the songs that makes it bluegrass music. And so that's why we. We don't call ourselves a bluegrass band, even though maybe some of our songs, even the way we play them, would be bluegrass music. And that's that's kind of interesting to to, to add to that. This this led to kind of a debate this morning. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're still a band. We survived it, which is good. Uh, but but we, uh, you know, it's, it got me thinking that you know Ben's example just a moment ago of a tuba, a tuba, a flute, and a piano were playing Gold Rush. If I heard that, I'd probably say, oh, that's not bluegrass. But if people saw us playing, you know, uh, uh, something on a guitar, a banjo, and a mandolin, even without truly listening, they'd probably say, oh, they're bluegrass players, right? right. Well, we get so, it all the time after our gigs. People right. say, oh, I love bluegrass. But we don't self-identify ourselves as bluegrass. That's right. I hope I don't offend anyone here, but there was a really popular band a couple years ago, Mumford & Sons, and I would always hear people calling them bluegrass, and it's like, Sounds like house music to me. It's like <laughs> on every beat. And that's not bluegrass, but everyone sees the the fiddle and the banjo and the guitar, and it's oh, it's a bluegrass band. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we don't know bluegrass. I, so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you guys we don't know anything. Yeah, actually, <laughs> no. Uh, so actually, this is a good segue. Uh, th so wh where we'd like to, to take this now is uh, to, to show you, you know, kind of where where we started and how we put together this group. Um, we we actually uh, being focused or uh, centered in the Finger Lakes and uh, Buffalo, Rochester, Western New York. There's there's a pretty healthy uh, old time music tradition in that area of uh, New York State. Have That's you guys talked about old time music? Okay. Okay. Not a lot. Okay, cool. It's, yeah. it's like sort of an ancestor of bluegrass in a way, but they've they both coexist today as well. Exactly. Um, so we identify certainly as uh, as, as much of a of an old time band uh, as well. So um, there are certain things that, that are very similar, and and there again there are certain things that are very different, mm -hmm. um, and, and different styles and approaches uh, that that are different. So so that last example that we played, you you heard our interpretation and, and uh, um, uh, feel of of what bluegrass sounds like to us. Um, we'll play in old time. And this is, yeah. I would think this is a pretty traditional way of playing an old time tune. Yeah. Um, same same genesis, they come from the, the Appalachian Mountains and you're playing fiddle tunes that, that really usually go back to across the pond, Irish music and Scottish music. and um, they, they sort of took form on, on these American instruments. Um, as old time, what would be called? I mean, they didn't call it old time music back in the old days, but we call it old time music. Um, they call I think it's music from you know, time. Yeah, time music. Yeah. Now time music. Um, 
But yeah, this might be a pretty authentic way of playing this old tune called Old Chattanooga. At the time, it was called Chattanooga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, C? We'll go to C? C. Okay. That's a great question. I think um, I would say I would say lyrics um, in these traditional genres, whether it's bluegrass or or old time music, um, the, they they you know we we obviously just open with with two instrumentals. Um, so so the, there there's obviously no lyrics to to influence that. However. Uh, yeah, oftentimes when you think of think of bluegrass songs, the, the the lyrics or the subject matter has to do with you know lost love or and God. Or, um, I think a lot of it came yeah. out of gospel. Music. True. Yeah. Yeah. You know, very true. Um, and and we'll, Carter family. Yeah. So that's a good question. We'll 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 play some songs in, uh, in a few minutes here, and um, and and that's a, that's a really good good point. But, but like, you, could you write a, a bluegrass song about existentialism? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't see why not. You know? <laughs> I don't. Know. It's a feeling you get out of the out of the people. 
Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I would think the content could be anything, but well, again, you know, it's a, it's a loose definition. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to touch on there, like, what kind of differences did you guys see between the first tune we played and, and this one, as far as how we played it? We all played the same thing. Yeah, the second time, right? The, the first song, we kind of had little spotlights, a guitar part, and um, we kind of were more intricate in the arranging. And the old time song, um, it, I think it's less about spotlighting individuals, and it's more about this cohesive groove that you establish. And, uh, have anybody here ever been to an old time jam? Um, well, has anybody ever been to a bluegrass jam? You guys were just jamming up Joe Val. And so at a bluegrass jam, um, the, the, the kind of the point of the jam is, is really the, the picking, right? Like, let's see that mandolin solo, boy. Banjo player, you know, kick it in. And, and it's really like playing, like flashy playing. And in an old time jam, you could play the same tune like that for 20 minutes. And, and nobody's showing. And, and you look at the faces, you know. And it doesn't, it doesn't look like anybody's having any fun, but inside it's like... Yes, it's like it's, it's this groove, you establish this groove and you get this whole collective room of people and like 15 fiddles screaming on the same thing together and, and it's, it really, it's, it's powerful, it's like a drum circle almost, it's not about, you know, showing your expertise on an instrument, it's more about like locking in together and, and doing this thing together. I would say that's, that's probably, out of, out of both music, what they have very similar is that right there, is that the groove is what you need in both of them. Now they're both True. different grooves, you know, in bluegrass and the first one, it's a lot of boom and chuck, you know, boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck. Mm -hmm. Old time, it's a little, it's a little different, but you gotta feel that. That's mm -hmm. like the important, mm -hmm. definitely the important aspect of both music, I think. Absolutely, and, and coming into this also, uh, for myself, you know, it was a, I had to, to truly understand that, that these instruments here are cogs in a machine, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody has their part and their role to play, um, and this is coming from from uh, an electric guitar player who used to play screaming Pink Floyd solos, you know. So <laughs> I had to let my ego go a little bit uh, to just kind of and know that you're really crucial to right. what happened. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I kind of had to do the opposite. Right. I'm very. Uh, in, in, in blue, like kind of the question you just asked in bluegrass music, I would say typically the 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 focal point of the song is the singer, and uh, jams aside, um, and so you have this song, and if that's kind of sort of the focal point is who's singing, and then the instruments sort of support it and, and highlight different aspects of of the song as you go through the song, and typically in old time music, everything is about the fiddle. And to, to like the whole thing revolves around this fiddle line, and the guitar is providing the rhythm, the bass is providing the rhythm, the banjo is providing the rhythm for the for the fiddle to sort of soar on top of everything. Yeah, play through the whole thing. And when you when you when you connect, when you feel that rhythm together, uh, th that's what makes it such a social music and such a, a, a folk music. Um, is when you start to get into that groove, and when you really do feel it. You can, like Ben said, you can you can jam on, you know, a three chord tune for twenty minutes, and it, and it feels good. There's something yeah. just like it's all locking in, and it. it and and it really, all this all this music started out as dance music. It was all for a social gathering of some kind, and and so really, that groove was champion. Nobody was really paying attention to what the musicians were doing, as long as they were providing some framework that people could dance to. The dancers were happy, and. Um, Unfortunately, there's still there's still a huge society of people that get off on dancing to this kind of music. But um, I think that our mission as a band, like we all loved the old time music and we loved that groove, but it's not the most appealing thing for an audience to sit and watch a band just groove and freak out on rhythm for five minutes and then do it again for five minutes and then do it again. Unless you're playing a dance, that's not what people would want to pay money to see. So. We started using that as sort of our our our, um, our building block for what we wanted to do, but sort of incorporate more interesting things, like the three part harmonies and the, the solos, and work that stuff into this framework of, of old time right. music. I think this is a good moment to go into our next song, um, especially about lyrics. Sure. Because this is a song that you wrote. 
Mm -hmm. and I feel, yeah. Oh, man. That's really, yeah. That's yeah, really that's true. true. Even though there's no lyrics, mm -hmm. are you singing the song to yourself as you're playing? Oh yeah, I come from, it, um, explained a little earlier, I'm in an Irish traditional band in uh, And in Irish traditional music, the tune is key. And you have to be able to sing the tune. So if I was to play, let me think, what's a good one that I know? Uh, it's called Musical Priest, so I'm thinking about so just from being in that background, coming into this, I think it helps a lot. You should be able you should be able to know these tunes well enough. Yeah to be able to sing them to yourself while you're playing. But it shouldn't be taxing either. It should be just kind of natural, you know, and it helps, it helps a lot, I would say. Yeah, that's a good point. That makes sense. Um, so, so our old time, our old time uh, kind of influence, uh, we, we, we mix up our, our live performances with, with quite a bit of, um, influence from from uh, different genres uh, you know people always ask us what kind of band are you and and I always say string band because that's, that's about, about as bad as you can get but it still it still communicates something right when I say string band you something comes to mind you know and that can that what can be the, the a other, lot of things the other one yeah, mountain, we, music? mountain music is, is a good is a good one um, so so as uh, Ben was saying earlier is that the uh, old time uh, tradition is very much about setting that groove, very much about, uh, you know, feeling that and feeling that laid back. But sometimes it's not, uh, you know, uh, where we can admit it's not as exciting. So I, I, f I feel like that's where the bluegrass tunes come in, yeah. into our set. Um, we always tend to end with a bluegrass song, uh, you know, and we, we, we pick bluegrass songs in our set for those moments when we really want to bring the energy high and, um, really uh, you know, get people way. into it. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, no, we can touch on instrumentation later. Just talking about that energy. Um, seems like most of the songs we call bluegrass songs, besides that one we started with, which was instrumental, all incorporate the three-part harmony, which really, like, kicks things up a notch. You know, when, when if you're playing at a bar or something, and, you know, people are just there to enjoy themselves, not necessarily to see us. When we kick in with something where we're all three singing together in harmony, that's when, you know, it starts to turn. It's like really kind of yeah. jars the room. Let's play. Let's play Foggy Mountain Top. Okay. Let's do that one first. Yeah. Yeah. Traditional. Uh, you guys know Foggy Mountain Top? You know this tune? It's um, the Carter family uh, did it, and I think I think if I'm not mistaken, that was one of the earliest recordings um, of this song. Um, I, I heard this, uh, or saw it actually on, on YouTube, it was Doc Watson uh, playing and, and uh, you know, this live concert, it was really fantastic, I, I really loved the song uh, from there on. So, so this was one of the earliest bluegrass songs, songs that we decided to put into our repertoire and this was a, what, the first time I, I suppose that we were really uh, started thinking about truly three part harmonies and, and uh, and thinking of things in arrangement in that way. So and before yeah. this, even though I I would sing a lot in my head, I I was not very confident singer outwardly. Uh, but this this kind of music has really helped me develop my voice a lot. I am I have a very high tenor voice, so <clears throat> it helps. Yeah, uh, it makes me feel feel better about my singing. <laughs> <other people. laughs> yeah, singing other people. And we need you because I'm not singing that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stand up. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I love the best. 
into bluegrass um, and some things that we do we, we, we try to sound as as purely uh, bluegrass as possible uh, when we, when we, we decide some, it's gonna be that way exactly so a couple of features there you know of course uh, that we didn't do in the old time tune uh, Charlie and I took solos uh, we had the three-part harmony uh, there's there's our lyrics of uh, of uh, being away from home that kind of thing and, yeah See, there's a two-part chorus. There's yeah. the tenor third above. And that makes yeah. It. But where does the third part come in? Are they sing the alto part, an octave lower, or are they sing? It, it's where, where does that they call it a baritone harmony, and, and it, it's we were just talking about this yesterday. It, it's usually the weirdest harmony. Like mm -hmm. the the tenor part can kind of stand alone on its own as a nice melody. Um, the baritone can sometimes, if you just heard it alone, it, it might not sound much like a melody. It kind of fills in the gaps of the chords that you're playing and. In this case, I think I'm under you the whole time. I'm just just below the melody. Um, I couldn't tell you if I'm playing the singing the root or the fifth of the chords we're doing. But it changes throughout the chords. I, you want to um, try that? Out of the three, I would say for, for that part, when um, a lot of times they're moving like together, yeah. um, but then at one certain part, the lower harmony can't move with us. Yeah, so it's it, might, it might stay there, or it might have to drop lower where they go up, just to. To make it make sense and it's not something we get very academic about I wish we knew more about yeah. picking out harmonies um, so we just basically thing. find something that works and go with it well, I mean, let's, let's, let's sing that acapella let's let's sing the chorus mm -hmm. if I was on some foggy mountain top I'd sail away to the west I'd sail all around this whole wide world to the girl I love the 
the best. So there was one. You go, I'm love. You guys go yeah. up and I go down. Yeah. Other than that, I'm pretty sure we were moving together. in parallel. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the harmony side certainly are our big characteristic of, of bluegrass. There's a, a harmony, a vocal harmony they call the high and lonesome sound. Um, and uh, there's a there's a specific interval to it. Uh, do you know Do you know uh, the the high lonesome sound? Is it is that a fourth? Uh, I, uh, well, a, I know yeah. that you can change the inversion so that you have two sure. parts above the lead. Right. right. Sometimes, or else you can do one part below, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. yeah. and then add another fourth part that's above the high oh, part. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah. You're talking about. yeah. 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 Something yeah. like that. But you, you know, you, you just know it when you hear it. Stanley you know, Brothers. You ever listen to the Stanley yeah, Brothers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sitting shivers down your spine. Right. I think a lot of that singing uh, was rooted in some church. I, I don't. There's a there's a specific sect of church in the south that if, if you hear their services it sounds just like the Stanley Brothers like yeah. mm -hmm. that just the, the singing they sing in church and it, it, I don't I don't know much about it but mm -hmm. I heard it on NPR once yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when Peter Paul and Mary sang depending upon who had the melody mm -hmm. so if Paul had the melody he's the low voice then Peter sang the tenor over him and Mary sang the alto part over that uh -huh. If Peter was the singing, Mary sang the out, the tenor over it, and Paul sang the low underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they just, they rotated That's interesting, those yeah. different parts depending upon where the, the range of the melody. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. sure. I'm, for the most part, we have our melody in the middle. Yeah. We, usually, I think. Yeah. No yeah. matter who's singing, whoever's singing the melody out of any three of us is usually in the middle. Yeah. And, um, Typically, if Charlie's singing harmony, he just sits at the high harmony more naturally, and I'd sit at the low harmony more naturally. Um, right. It's a little bit easier to balance it when you're when you're a trio, uh, because that's really... for all guys. I, like, yeah. If we had a female, obviously we'd have to work in two lower harmonies or something. Which would be pretty weird. Well, What's effective? You... Yeah. Like the harmony should purely be a supporting role. You don't you don't ever want it to overpower the melody. The melody should be the focal point. So so whoever's singing the melody, if, if there were two upper harmonies, you know, you see the problem there. Like now now the upper register is overshadowing yeah. the melody. Yeah. Whereas this truly balances out, you know, you have a, a lower part, a higher part and the melody just sits nicely in, in, in the center. The higher the harmony and a lot of times Charlie can't hit it unless he really has to shout. You know, you need a lot of air to get that high sound. And, or, and so we, we, when we sing at our shows, we have one microphone. We all sing into one microphone. Um, it gets complicated sometimes when, when you have to get so loud to sing, he almost has to turn his head away from the microphone I back up to, to keep it balanced. Otherwise, all you'd hear is him and you'd lose the melody that we had. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about also in, in that song, uh, Lyrically, what I what I loved and what, what I was drawn to uh, a lot when I first heard it was was the the storyline of here's this guy sitting in jail, you know, reflecting on on uh, the things that that his his mother said if he had only listened to her, you know, and not gone gone and, and chased after this girl, he wouldn't end up in prison, right, or in jail. And you wonder, like that leaves a lot of a lot of uh, kind of questions in your mind, like what what. <laughs> and, and I don't think it, it's ever truly answered. Um, the there might be, you know, and this is where folk music can get a, a, a little bit fun. You know, um, if we were covering a Beatles song, you know, there's a there's there's a, a set of expectations that you would have, right? Can't change the lyrics. I can't the change song. the lyrics to yeah. let it be, you know, uh, <laughs> without you guys noticing and saying. No, that's just not. <laughs> um, Folk music, you can kind of do that. I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe the real bluegrass purists wouldn't wouldn't be into that. The, um, but I think as a band, we we do this a lot, and as songwriters ourselves, we we kind of try to find uh, ways that we can put our stamp on uh, different songs. I mean, um, so often when you listen to one recording of a song, and and the lyrics are, you know, one verse might be different than a recording, the same right. song but a different recording, and different people do it different yeah, ways. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think that's probably just because it's it's an oral music. It's been passed down orally from generation to generation, so the the words get changed from or, or from location to location. And this this song in particular, the the last verse, the the Carter family uh, recording, which which is the same as Doc Watson. That last verse always bothered me. It was it was um, if you go out of court, and my boys, I'll tell you how to do. 
uh, take out your, your navy blue or like wear your navy blue or something like that. It was a, just kind of strange. Put on your tails and wear your navy blue, right? So that didn't sit well. I didn't, it didn't, for me, it didn't, uh, it didn't give any resolution to this story, you know? Um, it's like, okay, so this guy ends up in jail because he's chasing after this woman. Um, so let me give you a piece of advice. When you're going out chasing women, you know, put on your, put on your best coat. <laughs> it was just strange. So, um, playing in the Irish band, I don't know if, uh, if anybody's familiar with it. There's an old Irish folk song called Black Velvet Band, and, um, it's kind of similar. It's a, yeah, it's a tune about, uh, a woman with a questionable yeah. occupation, I think. Yeah, the yeah, right? yeah. guy, is, the main singer of the song is this guy who's going after this girl, um, and she, like, she tricks him. Right. They're walking around town, and she takes money out of this guy's pocket and then puts it in his pocket. And so this guy comes back, because right. he notices that it's gone, and finds it with the guy. And it's the girl with the, the, the black velvet band in her hair, oh. right? Yeah. So, so drawing from some of that influence, uh, I changed the last lyric to, if you go out of court and my boys, I'll tell you how to do. Beware those girls with them pretty blonde curls, or you'll end up in this old jailhouse, too. It makes sense. Yeah. And it, it kind of just ties everything everything together a little bit nicer um, than, than the way it's traditionally sung. So, don't give so, too much away. Either. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, you know, our, our always kind of on our radar when we're doing this stuff is is how can we put our stamp on something? You know, there might be a, a bluegrass player who, who plays this tune that they might hear. Oh, wow, that's, that's kind of cool, you know? Yeah, never and heard that verse before. Someday we'll be, we'll be sitting at a... Watch a bluegrass concert and they'll sing our verse, you know. <laughs> it might be kind of cool. Um, so uh, this next song that we'll do is an original uh, of ours, and this is a, a song that that we feel is is our most or one of our most bluegrass uh, influenced originals. Um, and this is actually a song that was written uh, for a friend of mine who who moved. Uh, to Florida. She was living in Buffalo and she moved uh, down to Florida and uh, I was playing at her, her going away party or her farewell party and, and um, uh, my wife now, she suggested to me, uh, why don't you write a song for her, you know, for this party? And so, so I, I wrote this song and, and we ended up really kind of loving it and, and you know, making it fit, fit into our style. I'll show you kind of the origins of it in a moment, but, um, but we'll play the song first and this is this is Mallory. Why, why, don't, you, why don't you play what it used to be? Play like, that first. Yeah, yeah. Matt wrote this probably six or eight years ago, and it was a different band we had then. It was an electric band, bass and drums, and it, it kind of had more of a, a pop feel to it. And when this group got together, we really liked it and wanted to keep the song, and but it didn't really fit our new sound, this sound. So we had to kind of tweak it to make it fit this sound. Right. But why don't you play how it used sure. to go? So, so the intro, it, it started with, with, a, with a melody that I had uh, on the guitar already. Uh, it went like this. Uh, not like that. So awkward. I haven't played it that way yeah. so long. <laughs> so it was a little kind of had a, a poppy kind of uh, kind of. So beat when it. we first started playing it, he he was still doing that melody on the guitar, and Charlie was doing the melody on the fiddle, and and like something was missing. It just didn't have the support that our other songs did. So we said, well, what if just Charlie plays the melody on the fiddle, and Matt does more of just like regular boom chuck, like you hear in bluegrass music, and. And it kind of fell together into the sound, you know. And we with little after, tweaks here and there. That's right. And after having figured out our, our vocal harmonies for Foggy Mountain Top, we, we followed suit with this one also yeah. for for the harmony. Um, and this is what it became. Mallory 
found like rain comes pouring down here. Chase your dreams for free. She booked a flight for late on August night. She said, I'm gonna make a southern girl of me. I'm gonna make a southern girl of me. She drove her car down the road to her old man's bar. She walked right in with a smile. She poured a beer, said, I ain't gonna bartend here. Tomorrow I'll be leaving for a while. That's right. Tomorrow I'm gonna leave town for a while. She looked around, said, take me southern bound, where the warm winds blow. She's flying down to that sunny Florida town. Don't forget the snow in Buffalo. Don't forget the snow in Buffalo. Luggage tag. She said, you can't make me stay. I made a deal with them boys down at Pottersfield. Today will be my last Sunday fun day. Today will be my last Sunday fun day. She looked around, said, Take me southern bound where the warm winds blow. She's flying down to that sunny Florida town. Don't forget the snow in Buffalo. Don't forget the snow in Buffalo. Goes around now, comes around now, blowing with the wind. I am certain my heart will be hurting, watching the snowflakes spin. Cogs of the wheel. Yeah. We can talk about how we best provide the cogs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, start with bass and guitar. Like, well, why don't we, why don't we start with vocals and lyrics? I mean, that that would be king. Right. <laughs> That's on a song like that. Yeah, you 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 never want to do anything instrumentally that gets in the way of what you're doing vocally. So a good example is during those verses, Charlie's still playing the fiddle when Matt's singing. But he'll really only do something um, cool after a, a lyric line. So, Mallory, you found a rain come pouring down here. Get your And it almost continues that vocal line through the end of the phrase. Uh, but other than that, he's just being really simple behind the lyrics. And dynamics, use of dynamics being, you know, when it's your part to come out, for, for at least a lead lead role. Um, it's really, you got to come in hard, but then once those lyrics come in, you got to you gotta pull yourself right back. Be right down low. Mm -hmm. be yeah. yeah, I mean, the volume of all three of our instruments probably doubles when you're not singing. As soon as you start singing, we all bring it down. And then when the fiddle starts screaming, it's like, we're, we're all ramped up. And um, I guess that, that just lets, you know, kind of the point of the song, the lyrics, carry through. Right. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, to add to that, too, uh, we we thought about that a lot. You know, these these are things that we discussed. It wasn't necessarily something that was innate in our in our thinking. Um, again, I think Ben mentioned that we're, 
you know, the two of us had more more or less uh, rock band and, uh, you know, blues backgrounds and that kind of thing where you just plug in, you know, you're singing into microphones anyway and everybody's just playing as loud as possible. Um, Charlie was more or less raised on, on Irish fiddle music, so he had a little bit more of, of this uh, Usually ear. just, if when you're yeah. Irish fiddling, you just play the melody. Right, so, right. Uh -huh. So a song like this, you know, you really have to think about that. You have to Who think about what? the levels. Um, and even though when we play live shows, we're, we're normally amplified, we're plugged in, uh, we, do, we do the traditional uh, one mic, one vocal mic uh, singing in that. So, so we have a little bit more of a, of a connection with each other, I mm -hmm. think, and we're, with that play. although, although we, we're coming out of speakers, we're, we're hearing our instruments Hear and we're hearing ourselves. Right? I, I was finding there for a second, uh, even though we don't have anything plugged in, I was still starting to lean over. And like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, al it's almost it's weird when we're yeah. when we're singing it. Yeah, we're <laughs> singing this formation. Well, yeah. it really does make a difference when I can hear your voice right. right here. I don't even have to think about my harmony because it just like my whole cranium just like resonates. <laughs> <laughs> really, and, and, and you can you can feel it right inside your head yeah. with, that you wouldn't be able to feel it here. That's true. And so that when you get really close to each other, it's like the harmony just it's, lights up your head. Cinematically, it looks better too. It yeah. looks better. <laughs> <laughs> How can we be authentic without it? Um, but for me, it's like a nice set of bearded headphones, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that song, um, you know, I, I wrote I wrote when I was when I was uh, more playing playing uh, uh, popier kind of rock music. So there's a bridge in there. I don't know if you caught that, where we went to the to the B minor chord and you know middle eight. Uh, section where it, things change. It's not the same verse and chorus. Uh, it's pretty unusual in bluegrass music. Uh, you don't really hear bridges too often. I, can anybody think of a? Can you think of a, an example or anything? I don't know. A bridge yeah, is rare. kind of strange. They're very rare. Yeah, exactly. Day bluegrass. I think you hear yeah. a lot. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Newgrass kind of stuff. Yeah. But but one thing I just want to talk about is um, kind of the the bass and the guitar. Um, or when we're in our fiddle guitar banjo setup, really it falls on the guitar. The role that it has to fill rhythmically is, is um, coming from our blues rock and roll background, I tend to think of it as a kick and a snare. Um, if, if, you, if you count this music out, Chuck is whether you're playing old time or bluegrass music. Um, that's really like the foundation that, that everything sits on top. Is this one two one two one two one two? Um, it's a, and and, it, and it, it's it's surprisingly challenging to to train yourself to to just stick to your role and not you know. And anytime you have an instrument in your hands, I think you want to try to like do something with it. Um, and but you, you need to understand that like. The power of this music comes in comes from each person filling a role, and when you add it all together, there's the sum of the parts is what makes it so powerful. Mm -hmm. And what's what's neat when you see bluegrass players playing live too, um, it's a different experience than when you're watching videos on YouTube or, or such. Because uh, obviously, where does the camera go? Uh, you know, it goes to the solo instrument. So mm -hmm. you know, you're watching you're watching a bluegrass band, and you know, there's a there's a fiddle solo. Well, that's where the camera's going to go. Um, we had this experience when we were down in Ithaca a few weeks ago and we saw uh, a band called the Lonely Heart String Band. You know them? Yeah, yeah. They were from Joe. Oh, they were. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, fantastic. So we, we met those guys and they, they did a cool little seminar and they were they were talking about different things. And uh, mandolin player, what was his name? Do you, do you remember? Uh, I can't, I can't recall his name. Yeah, but anyway. Oh, right, right. Mandolin? Yeah. Um, Watching him play, I mean, you know, he's just phenomenal player, and, and he would, when it was his turn to solo, I mean, he was, you know, he wouldn't step hold out. back, and he'd step, step out, but then when, when they were playing as a group, he wasn't afraid to just, yeah, like a world-class musician, it's okay to just be a drummer for a minute, right, yeah, and he would, he would do that, he wouldn't even, like, play chords sometimes, he would, he knew, okay, just that, that, 
a snary kind of chucking sound on the mandolin was was where he fit into this group, and that was that was pretty cool to see. That's a good point too. That their group is a is a five piece group, yeah. so they've got a lot more sound and power coming out of them. And for mandolin, I mean that's that's pretty much all. For the most job. part, yeah, that's your job. Yeah. But sometimes playing? as a three piece, we need to fill in a little bit more. But that's sure. song yeah. to song. That's good point. When you're playing the bass beat, are you playing ahead of it or on it? That's a really interesting notion. Um, this this instrument, any upright bass, it, the the wavelengths are so long that it, it kind of takes a takes a second for a note to well up through the air. And um, that was a frustration I always had with it. Is I would feel I would feel like I'm right on the beat. And I'd listen back to the recordings, and it's like that bass note was just a, a hair late. And I think it's just because it takes a second for that sound to sort of like pressurize through the air. And um, actually, it was the, the bass player for Lonely Heartstring that we just had the seminar with him a couple weeks ago. And he, I brought that up to him, and he said, um, instead of thinking about your, your attack, in other words, like your finger on the string, as the note, think of, pretend this string is a finish line of a race, and you're running through that finish line, and, and that finish line has to break, like you run through it. And it's that breaking point. It's, it's all very conceptual. But, so think about that breaking point as the note. And in order to do that, you almost have to, you almost have to get there just a millisecond early. And so instead of thinking like, my finger touching the string as the note, I have to think of the like the breakthrough as the note. So you build momentum before the note. Yeah, the so I, I'm not really, I'm not trying to be ahead of the beat, um, but but you do, you do have to push the envelope. Yeah, you, ha you have to you have to push it. Otherwise, you're going to start to to lag, um, and maybe not even you won't even slow down, but the groove will just feel a little heavy. Right. If that bass is just a slightest bit behind, it's like holding you down. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a lot of this music, bluegrass in general, the, both the downbeat and the backbeat are, are on the front ends of those beats. You know, if you're listening to soul music, that backbeat is like... It's like back, on the back side of the beat. And this, you, you really have to think of the, the front side of the beat. You're, you're not thinking rushing or playing faster. It's just you want to hit that beat you know, you want to hit that point on the front end of it. Which I think is what makes Bluegrass so exciting to listen to. Yes. Yeah, like you always got to have this forward You kind of get amped up to it. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, it's a, you know, it's another good kind of thought. Um, that's helped me a lot, too, in order to stay um, pushing forward. Is to actually, I mean, you don't necessarily need to lean real far forward, but like think in your head of like moving this way, mm. and you'll tend to stay yeah. forward. Like as a bass player, as an electric bass player, uh, in blues music, soul music, funk music, I would often find myself standing like this, you know, because <laughs> you're like you're sitting back. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta put that on the line. Yeah, you know? hold it real high. It's real high. And, uh, so it makes it funky. You know? <laughs> but, it, but yeah, in, in this music, I, I find myself like almost hunched over sometimes because I'm thinking forward instead of thinking back. Yeah. Um, I heard this are, you, are you a bass player? Yeah. And, and yeah. how do you think about it in bluegrass music? Well, I, I just was at a workshop at Val Joe, uh -huh. and I really didn't think about it. And and the bass player there said, "Set your metronome, and when you're playing your your bass, make sure you cover up the metronome sound." Okay. So you're playing ahead of it, so that because if you play every time the metronome goes click click click, yeah. you you missed it. You missed it. Yeah. So his his suggestion mm -hmm. was, cover up the metronome sound, mm -hmm. and that way you'll be playing slightly ahead of it. And it's the tension between the banjo player and the bass player that gives the energy to the... Cool. Mm -hmm. to the yeah, yeah to the you can sound. hear a banjo roll in bluegrass, like, and it's almost like just slightly on the back side of the beat. But anyway, like, I, I can't really explain it, but I know, I know what he means there. Oh, I cool. just heard about it this weekend, so now i got to... Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. another, another really fun metronome exercise as a bass player is put that beat on the chop. So put the, the click, ding, ding, 
<coughs> instead of on the downbeat, you're going. So the, the metronome is almost like a mandolin player, and you're filling in the space between the, the clicks. I think they're both important. You you wanna you wanna work on setting the metronome on the one and three, but try it on the two and four too, because then then you're playing with the metronome. You're like you're the bass player, and the metronome is the mandolin player. That goes for mandolin players too. Like yeah, act as the metronome being the bass. Right. You, know, you can get that. You can get that chop. Just. A lot of people put down practicing to a metronome, but we're all three really for it. I always say, you know, people are like, a metronome's a robot, you know, it'll turn you into a robot. But if you can make that robot swing, <laughs> then you're doing a really good job. You, know? you take down swang, that's a good <laughs> Do, did you have something to say? Uh, well, I, I just yeah. want to say, you know, I, yeah. I, somebody told me that, that, that when they were thinking about the beat on that, the head of the, 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 the beat or behind it slightly, mm -hmm. it says it's like a train. The train gets there, you know, the train gets there. You can either be in the head, in the first car or the last yeah. car. It, so it, it's just a mental image of, of what it might mean to be sort of on the edge of the beat or a little behind it. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good good way to put that. Yeah, yeah. good illustration. Yeah. Right. Um, so they're not all crossing that line at the same time, but um, but still getting to where they need to be. Yeah. You guys want to play Cherokee Shuffle? Go sure. back to the old yeah. time. So yeah, this is a good example of bluegrass. This is an old. This is like a crossover tune. You'll hear it in bluegrass and in old time jams. Um, Sometimes it, we play it probably a little more old timey because we don't have solos. Well, we do in the beginning. Um, but. But once we kick in to full force, it's pretty much just a groove song. But we kind of add little accents here and there. This is a good song that we do that kind of gets best of both worlds. Yeah. I, I just, I being an Irish player, I just enjoy playing playing main melody a lot. It's a lot easier for me. I can I can play a little bit with it. It's fun, but I don't have to. Because sometimes thinking of solos on the spot is difficult. It's not easy unless you practice it. But, you want to um, show them the the old time. Oh yeah, sure. sure. Sometimes, the funny thing about old time too is sometimes it'll be a D, sometimes it'll have three parts. While well, bluegrass, the bluegrass version, I feel like it's usually A, two parts. Yeah, bluegrass will always be an A for this song. Um, it is interesting. Yeah. The other thing about the difference between old time and bluegrass music is, um, Steve, you're more experience in playing old time, so correct me if this isn't so, but it seems like in bluegrass music, the fiddle will always be tuned standard, and the banjo is pretty much always playing out of G, or G tuning. Um, and in old time music, there's all sorts of weird fiddle tunings, and also banjo tunings. It's pretty rare to have, to have a retuned banjo in, in bluegrass. I mean, some are not retuned, but mostly it's not retuned. Like we'll yeah. we'll yeah. always be going back and forth. We'll have to plan our set, because I play out of G tuning and also double C tuning, and he's in cross tuning, and uh, yeah. raise the G to an A. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite one, though, I would say is our C, C, C set, yeah. set, we call mm -hmm. it. Because I tune every tune single string down. down. Yeah. So I turn it instead of a G, D, A, E, I do a G, C, G, D. And I, I, well, for my own instrument, I feel like it opens it up real nice. Oh, right. yeah. but to go down to yeah. that, <laughs> back up to this. And then, but it gets easier as you go. So, so old timey version? Yeah. So as we mentioned, this is Cherokee Shuffle. Uh, this is a, a tune that's. that's uh, a standard in the old time circle, uh, as well as the, the bluegrass circle, um, as a lot of them are. Uh, and, and so we'll show you the old time, the old time way to play this first. Yeah.
Yeah, so we took that sort of framework and fleshed it out a little bit. Made it more of our own style. Mm. Really, like said, we're going to do this at this part, yeah. we're going to do this here, and do that there. So kind of like what we were talking about, like keeping this old time tradition, but making it a little more exciting for the audience, perhaps. And um, we, worked, we, really, we really worked on your guitar part. Yeah, yeah. So you'll hear in this one, our arrangement uh, starts with a guitar solo. Um, and uh, uh, kind of making it a little a little more bluegrass. Um, does anybody know Tony Rice? Tony Rice, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic guitar player. Uh, arguably the best bluegrass flat picker. Um, has been one of my heroes uh, since I, I really started delving into this music. Um, so, so a lot of things I draw from and, and, and versions of, of tunes I draw from is, is from Tony Rice. Um, and this, this, uh, this is a the intro is a guitar intro that I that I sat down and kind of kind of really fleshed out and uh, composed more or less uh, to in that style. Um, but we we also uh, a little bit later in, in our arrangement listen for some rhythmic changes that we do uh, to kind of uh, change things up too, uh, which kind of makes it makes it the brothers blue uh, version. <laughs> Thank you. 